Welcome back to the channel, everybody. With me is Lake Speed Jr. He did my oil analysis for me, and I did it on the 26th, which was Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I sent it in to you on Monday when I was getting off work. I dropped it in the post office. And on Friday evening, I got my results in the email. And I was actually pretty surprised. <laughs> very, very quick. And I was actually the, I was very surprised to see everything all green. Just, well, not all green. The one thing that concerned me was the TBN. And I told you, you said you'll tell me why the TBN was. It was actually the viscosity, not TBN. We don't, we don't, oh, we don't test for TBN. We can talk about that in a little bit though. Right. Well, okay. Yeah. I don't there's, have there's a reason we don't test for TBN. Was it, a, was it vis yeah. Viscosity. For yeah, some viscosity reason, I was thinking TBN. It's a little bit low. Yeah. Viscosity at hundred degrees Celsius. So, mm -hmm. but, uh, so to let everybody know. Pull it up. Yeah. Go ahead and pull it up. Uh, yeah. During this oil change, I usually go 5,000 miles. I went 5,785 miles. I did run a tank of fuel injector cleaner and upper cylinder lube throughout that whole 5,000 miles. Um, mm -hmm. After I did the oil change, I was like, well, I'm already in here. I'm going to go ahead and change my spark plugs. So I have new spark plugs in it now. I did not change the spark plugs before I sent the sample off to you. Thank you, Mobile Diesel. That's awesome. I appreciate that. Um, so let's go over this report. I'm curious to know why my viscosity was low. So, All right. Can you see? Can you see I, the? Is it I, up? Yeah, I see it. I'll add it right here. All right. All right. Here we go. Perfect. All right. Here we go. All right. So let's actually we'll get back. Can we do, can we touch on the viscosity almost last? Sure. Well, let's okay. Start All right. So. Start. All right. Well, the the thing is, where I always begin. You know, the overall, the upper right hand corner where it says condition, that is the overall guide to the report. Like you said, you, you, we look at everything to tell us the story, not just only one thing. So sometimes, like in your case, you can have something, one value that's out of range and your results are still good. Rarely that it has happened that someone's results are all within the normal range, but we can still put the report up as a caution. And that's because the, the combination of maybe the mileage and all the results are like, it's normal in terms of the absolute values, but the picture here overall is saying there's something that doesn't add up. Something's not quite right. You need to, you need to continue to look at this. So to me, that's where you have to begin is that upper right hand corner at the condition and say, okay, what is the analyst telling me? Is, is he saying you're good? Everything's keep, keep, tr keep trucking along, keep taking sa uh, samples, build that trend analysis. That's what's going to tell us the real story. Or is he saying, Ooh, ooh we got to pump the brakes here a little bit. There's a problem we need to, we need to investigate. So in your case, even though your viscosity is slightly low, and we'll get there in a little bit, the whole picture says, man, Anthony's good. Telling me no, he's got nothing to worry about. Everything is really good. And as you mentioned, you know, you're 5,785 miles. You're using uh, the Amsoil 5W30. The interesting thing you kind of noted in the notes section, when you put in the submission form online, is you know this oil is supposed to be good for twelve thousand miles. Right. So, see that's actually where the viscosity being slightly low really doesn't concern me so much, especially knowing you used an upper cylinder lube uh, type additive in there. Those are the two things that have actually pushed that viscosity a little bit low. I'm going to make this bigger it, so they can see it on their screen. Sure. There we go. All right. So your viscosity is right at 8.3 centistoke. So the centistoke is the actual measured flow uh, of the oil at 100 degrees Celsius, which is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So a 30 grade oil, be it a 0 W30, 5 W30 like yours, even up to a straight 30, is going to flow between 9.2 and 12.5 centistokes. That's the 30 grade range. At 8.3, you're slightly low. You're about one centistoke 
below grade. So, but why is that not a concern? Well, the main reason that's not a concern is because I look down at the wear results, the wear metals at the very bottom of the page. And I look at that equipment health area and I'm like, okay, well, the main thing viscosity is going to impact first and foremost is the bearings. That's, that's going to be your primary thing. And in today's engines, those are probably going to be a, a bimetal bearing. In some cases, there's trimetal bearings. So trimetal bearings are copper, tin, and lead. Bimetal bearings are going to be tin and aluminum. And you look down there and you look at your uh, tin, copper, tin, lead, aluminum levels. I mean, these things are all single digits. They're all really low. My, yeah, there's nothing to be concerned here at all. The highest of those is 10 at 5 in the reality of used oil analysis. Because if people don't know, what, the way we determine the metals uh, in the oil, take the sample of that oil and we burn it. And you see, you burn it in a plasma. So it's incredibly hot. Well, when the elements burn, they emit wavelengths of light. You know, every different element on the periodic table has its own unique wavelength of light when you burn it. So you, then we can basically see, okay, what wavelengths of light are being emitted when we burn the oil. That's gonna tell us what's in the oil. Then the intensity of that light is gonna tell us how much there is of something in the oil. Hmm. Now, so, because we're having to burn it, go ahead. I was gonna say, so there's relatively no metal going on inside my engine is what what you're saying, right? A absolutely. So it only can see, so like a normal lab that uh, most high volume labs use it called uh, ICP, uh, inductively coupled plasma, where you take the sample of the oil, you dilute it with a solvent so that you can then spray it through that plasma. That allows you to process more things quickly. The problem is the results aren't quite as We'll call them accurate. You can't see particles quite as large because you're having to dilute that sample. The other way of doing it is called a rotating disk method or an RDE. And that is a slower method because you're actually, it says rotating a disk through it. Uh, but it allows you to see particles that are, you know, up to about 10 microns in size. So with this being the rotating disk method, and those things are all single digits. It's crazy low. In fact, the real reference standard is if, if it says it's less, if it's five or less, we really can't tell you with a high level of confidence what number it is. It's just there's a very small amount of something there. Right. And that could be from so, normal wear and tear. Oh, I, I, listen, you can run a brand new oil, like a brand new oil right out of the jug and put it in there and you're going to see ones and twos on some things anyway. Okay. It's just residual in the system. And, you know, they have lines and packaging equipment and things like that. So when you literally see copper at one, tin at five, lead at one, aluminum at three, manganese at one, uh, maybe those are all there at those exact numbers or maybe they're less than that they're probably not really going to be cons considerably more than that. You know, the iron at 10 is a great number uh, for this kind of engine because it's not like your engine's a Nicosil engine or something. It's an iron bore, right? It's a mm -hmm. uh, EcoBoost. So iron bore, direct injected engine that has uh, iron coating on the skirts of the pistons as well. So that's a really low level of iron it's doing a great job, which is why you go back to the overall condition. It's like, uh, yeah, the viscosity is a little bit low, but everything else is actually primo. The, that oil is doing a great job. Look at the additive package. It's very well balanced. The calcium is a thousand parts per million. And you can jump that back up to the middle. I'm kind of jumping around here. Sorry. Uh, if you look at the additives, uh, calcium, which is the detergent package, right at a thousand parts per million. Magnesium is 852. So it's a balanced blended uh, detergent package. And then you look at your, your phosphorus and your zinc, you're right there. You have mid 600, 700s. That's a, that's typical 
uh, for an API SP type package. Those are all within the, the normal specs. And you've got some molybdenum and you've got some boron. This is a really good balanced additive package for a street car. Now, that's not a racing package by any means, but for what you're doing for daily driving, that's a really great additive package. It very well balanced is what I mean by that. And the thing is, you can see the results. The other thing about this oil that is really impressive to me is the oxidation value. And we mentioned at the very beginning that we don't do TBN. Mm -hmm. So for people that don't know what TBN is, let me kind of explain what that uh, that means and then we, how that test runs. And then I can explain why we don't do it and don't believe in it. So TBN stands for total base number. You know, like in most things in chemistry, you got acids and bases. So when you put in additives, you know, like calcium and magnesium, those are what we call overbased additives. Their, their job is to provide, you know, that alkaline function to try to neutralize acids. Acids are a natural byproduct of combustion when you have sulfur and you've got different water and things, you know, fuel blow by all these free radicals, you know, that come from the unburnt combustion or partial combustion that gets into the crankcase. That's all building up and creating these acids. So the calcium and the magnesium as bases are there to neutralize those acids. So you don't have corrosive wear in your engine. So total base number is a way of measuring how much alkaline reserve, how much is left in that battery, if you will, to neutralize the acids. Now, the downside to that, because this all sounds great, right? It's like, why? Well, that sounds logical and makes sense. And many, many people will use TBN as a way of determining how far to go before they change their oil. Here's the downside to that. TBN was actually invented as a diesel oil test. Back when diesel fuel had much higher levels of sulfur. So because diesels are direct injection, they tend to have more fuel dilution than gasoline engines. And they would tend to create a lot more strong acids because you've got all this sulfur in the fuel that gets into the oil. You have oil, I mean, you have combustion that's going to be generating water. It's a byproduct of combustion is water. Mm -hmm. It gets into the crankcase. Now you get this mixture of water and sulfur, create sulfuric acid, begins to corrode the engine from the inside out. So that's where the idea of being able to put detergents like calcium and magnesium into the oil to neutralize those acids came around. And then a way to make sure those are still functioning was to do total base number. Again, all this sounds perfectly good and normal. Like, why in the world would you not do that? This seems like it makes sense. Well, the problem is we don't have high silver fuels anymore. You know, especially here in the United States and in, in Canada, we have ultra low sulfur fuels. Yeah. So guess what doesn't matter anymore? TBN. Exactly. It will actually lie to you. You can overextend your oil drain because those, those bases are designed to neutralize strong acids. What they don't measure are the weak acids. Because today with low sulfur fuels, with better synthetic base stocks and different additives, you're not creating those strong acids. A better judge of the oil's health is really the oxidation value. That's looking at how is that base oil holding up. And the other thing you want to do is couple that because that by itself isn't going to tell you the whole story. It will chemically tell you how chemically stable is that oil, is that base oil. It, yes, it can tell you that. And you could use that as a way of determining, well, how far am I going to go before I change my oil? But what that really presents is a greater question. What is your objective? If your objective of, for doing used oil analysis is to minimize the number of times you have to change your oil, well then, uh, okay, then 
follow that path. You know, monitor your oxidation value and find your driving pattern and what you do that can get that number to where you're optimizing your oil drain based on that. That's one way of going about it. I'm not saying it's the wrong way. It's a way of doing it. To me, the, oh, go ahead. Web, I was going to say another way, thing that caught my my attention after you get done saying what you were about to say is glycol and water. None of that was in the system. That's good. That means there's nothing leaking internally. No, it's great. I mean, your your yours is a clean bill of health. It looks really great. Uh, the the other thing you could do besides saying, okay, I want to try to minimize the number of times I have to change my oil. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Other thought is I want to obtain the lowest wear rate for my engine. So what is the I optimal oil change interval? And that's going to be a, not a fixed number. It's going to be a window based on conditions that gives me the lowest amount of wear. What's my wear per thousand miles? In your case, you have your wear per thousand miles is four. It's really good. Um, when you get down to the single digits, that's where you want to be. Especially low single digits is where you want to be. This oil could go further, without a doubt, based on what I'm seeing. In fact, back to the viscosity piece, they've designed the oil to go further, which is why the viscosity is a little bit low. The polymer they're using in the oil is shearing and breaking down, which is lowering the viscosity, which that's not abnormal because they're one of the ways Amsoil in the past has marketed their product is, hey, it's yes, it's, it's more expensive, it's synthetic, it's premium, but it'll pay for itself in the long run because you don't have to change the oil near as often. And that all that math works. I, I don't disagree with that. I think it's the right way to go. What you're seeing with the oxidation value being low, it means the oil isn't anywhere near used up yet. Just to give you an idea, the condemning limit for a synthetic oil like this that doesn't contain ester, because this, this oil does not contain ester. This is a, uh, probably a group three PAO blend based on what I'm seeing. That. Yeah, I was going to ask you yeah. that. So. Yeah, what I see here, this is a group three PAO blend um, is what I see from this is that you got to be 35 to 40 on oxidation value before you would say, okay, that oil's used up. It's time to change it. Um, oh, wow. So you're not even close. I'm nowhere yeah, near that. You're not even close. But here's the thing. As that oxidation value increases, the oil will begin to thicken. So that's why I'm saying that being at 8.3 isn't concerning because I can tell they've designed the oil to basically begin at the, the right viscosity in grade. And it's going to then shear out of grade initially. But then over time, as the oil begins to oxidize and thicken, it will come back into grade. That's what they've done here. Ah. And a lot of oils are designed that way. I mean, for example, Mobile One Zero W40. I rarely, like one in a hundred times, will you ever see a sample of Mobile One Zero W40 out of an engine that's still in the 40 grade range. They're all in the 30 grade range. That oil is right at the very bottom of the 40 grade range. And as soon as you put it in the engine, it begins to run the timing chains and everything start to, to act on it and begin to shear and break down those polymers. Boom. Viscosity drops. Well, you already said it when you said mobile. So I'm not a mobile I mean, fan. That's what they do. I mean, that, that oil does that. And, and it's funny. They have the mobile one zero forty ESP, which is what they have. Uh, for the Corvette, so they, they rebranded it as supercar oil. It doesn't do that. Hmm. Just the European one does. So it's funny. It's like they got this other one. This is 040. It doesn't shear and break down. They're using a different polymer uh, in, in that one, obviously. But the 040 European one, you find it, all, it always does it. I mean, just to the point where, I, I mean, I always flag it. If something's outside the range, it's going to get flagged because it's outside the range. And it's, I'm not doing you any service if I don't tell you when something's outside of where it's supposed to be. 
Is it a problem in your case? No. Um, but if it is a problem in someone's case, I got to say. Right. So we I, we, I will always flag anything that's abnormal, that's outside of a, of a specified limit because that's my job. But then we can also tell you whether or not someone's concerned about, right? Those are two different things. But yeah, if I look at your report overall, we start back to the top, say the viscosity, yep, that's a little bit low, but knowing what kind of well it is and everything, I see what they're doing. And the rest of the picture tells me there's not a problem. I'm fine. Oxidation value says oil's really new. Now, you got to remember, oxidation value is not going to be linear Linear, and how it progresses. It'll go along like this, and all of a sudden, it'll take off. That's how oxidation works. So just because it says it's uh, you're at almost 6,000 miles, which is half of what they said it can be, you're at eight, well, then you could triple it. Uh, I don't think so. Somewhere in that back half, it's going to probably start taking off. And they're probably right. Probably 12 is about where it's going to be. You could, if you wanted to, just try going a little bit further and see what happens next time. Or you can stay where you're at because you know where you're really good. There's no concern staying where you are in terms of your oil change and ripple with this product. The other thing that is excellent, and I think using the fuel additive you use beforehand is fuel dilution especially for a direct injection engine being at 0.91 less than one percent is where you want to be we typically see samples somewhere in the 1.5 to 1.8 range that's pretty typical i flag anything that's this two percent or greater and we get a big giant warning sign if it reaches four percent yeah. Months. Oh, last week we had several of them that, that were that way. Um, In fact, Darren, fuel dilution's big problem. Go ahead. Darren asked, what are the units of measure for the oxidation value? So it's, it's called an absorbance. So what we're doing is FTIR stands for Fourier Transform Infrared uh, Method. So you're basically taking a sample of the oil, you're putting on there and you're passing uh, infrared light through it and you're looking for where it absorbs how it kind of breaks out like a like a prism that tells you different bond angles so it's how the light is being absorbed so and that's a weird term so uh most people don't yeah if you don't if you've never seen how it looks it doesn't make any sense but it essentially if you had like a, you know, like a cardiac graph, right? Where you're thinking about your heart, you know, beat and everything. If you imagine that when you see something like um, there is something that's oxidized in the base oil, it goes from zero and then goes up. So anything that contains oxygen is going to push it up higher and higher and higher. So that number is going to increase, increase, increase. So for example, oils that are ester based you, from the very beginning, they could be in the 40 to 50 to 60 or 70 uh, absorbance range because there's so much oxygen inherent in an ester base stock. So, in those cases, you got to look at treat them differently and how, how they do. And those can degrade in a different way, especially ester sometimes can hydrolyze because when you make an ester, you're taking an acid and an alcohol, you react it, react it together and it creates an ester in water. So what can happen is short trip driving, long term storage, you know, after uh, moisture had built up in the crankcase you'll see the ester hydrolyze and begin to come apart. So in fact, for storage, um, I've seen an ester-based oil basically unravel where basically brand new, it should have been about 40 units of, of absorbance. And then what's happened is over time, it's dropped back to 12. It, it's fallen apart that much. It has done it just sitting, not driving. So, it's another great way of testing. So that's that where that unit is. Hopefully that makes sense and explains that question. And then I said, yeah, fuel dilution, of course, as you mentioned, water and glycol, those are both negative. So there's no coolant leak or anything. 
I mean, and then potassium is at seven. Uh, that's probably a remnant from the fuel additive. Sometimes uh, we can see uh, that depending on what the chemistry of the fuel additive is, it'll maybe leave, leave some trace levels of potassium. But at seven, it's not something, it's nothing to worry about. And the really good news is silicon uh, is at 11. That means your air filters are doing a good job because that's probably just a little bit of what's natural anifoam additive in the oil. So up to like, you know, seven, eight uh, ppm of silicon, that's all parts per million, by the way. Um, that's what it is. And all the wear measurements at the bottom of the page in terms of the additive levels and the wear metals themselves, all of that is parts per million. Very interesting report. I was yeah, I, your stuff looks great. I think one of my other oil changes I did, I went eight thousand miles, and I was like, man, I wish I would have known you because it was like summertime last year. I wish I could have mm -hmm. sent that one off to see what it was doing. But uh, I think on my next one, I'm gonna go right around the same mileage that I did on this one, and then send another sample to you. That way, I can get a trend analysis going, and we there can compare go. the uh, compare the two. Um, That's where it gets good. When yeah. you start building that history, then you can find the different anomalies and stuff like, like say, you if you don't run uh, upper cylinder lube, let's say you just ran a fuel detergent, no upper cylinder lube, just fuel detergent additive to clean the injectors and all that, and, and do that maybe a couple hundred miles before the oil change to give it any residual time to burn out of the oil and stuff to see what it does. That's why that's, that's what becomes really good here is you can begin to make subtle changes to your maintenance program, how you're doing things. And then you can see with that trend analysis over time, what's it doing? Is it helping you or hurting you? This is how, you know. So uh, with the upper cylinder lube, obviously it, it's a, uh, I run the AMS oil upper cylinder lube and the performance improver, which is the injector cleaner, uh, mm -hmm. fuel system cleaner. So the fuel system cleaner, you're supposed to do it like every 4,000 miles. Mm -hmm. I may or may not do it every 4,000. Um, and then the upper cylinder lube, it says that you can do it at every every fill up. But I don't do it at every fill up. I might do it like I wouldn't. one or every three or four or five fill ups, something like that. I don't do it every fill up. Um, so it would be may, interesting to see go for a full drain interval without ever using the upper cylinder lube. Yeah. And only use uh, yeah. the performance improver. So that would be um, one time for the performance improver, no upper cylinder loop. I'm going to do that yeah. on this one. Just to yeah, see, what it see, because that, that could be really interesting to see what that does. Begin Because it gives you the ability to control those variables and move those levers one by one and see what the outcome is. Because in the end, it doesn't matter what works, what doesn't work as long as you can find out what does work right. for you in your vehicle and how you drive, what does it want? This is how you can listen to what your vehicle wants and you can give it what it says it likes. And that also tells me, cause going back to the coolant, the glycol, cause obviously the turbo is liquid cooled, mm -hmm. no, no turbo leaks. I don't have anything leaking internally or externally. So that's really good. No. And the copper is super low cause typically, um, I don't know, or, those turbos oil cooled or are they water cooled water water I'm cooled a, okay but there's still, but the but the bearing the turbo shaft is still uh lubricated with engine oil right yes okay and so your your copper is super low and that's a great sign that that thing is working wonderfully because that's where you typically see with turbos you'll see a higher level of copper uh, because of you know it's typically a bronze uh, bearing inside the turbos, and you normally see a higher level than that. That's actually really excellent. That means that the turbo bearing is about to go out if you see high level of copper. Or the turbo is yep. going to go. Yep. Besides the vacuum cleaner noise and all that stuff that they make, and you won't go nowhere. <laughs> so typically, a, a turbocharged Porsche, you'll you'll between an NA one where the copper is typically going to be, you know seven ppm or less with a turbo one you're going to typically see about 17 18 maybe a little bit less but yeah when there's a problem it's going to push up and be probably over over 30 
in your case, man, you're you're at one. I mean, my God, that's, that's it. That's, is it even there? It's yeah. like, yeah, that is. It's literally almost nothing. So that one's excellent. And it will be interesting to see why is that so good, right? Is this um, the combination of everything you're doing right now is is the best combination you, you've got? Or by changing up, you know, uh, omitting the upper cylinder lube, does that help or hurt these results? That would be interesting to see. Uh, so I'm going to do it. I'm not going to put upper cylinder lube in it for this oil change. Um, I'll do the one bottle of fuel injector cleaner, and I'll probably do that at about 2,500 miles. And then there you go. So halfway between. And then when I get ready, and I'm going to use the same oil filter that I used last time, which I already did. There you go. So I'm using Perfect. a motor. I'm using a motorcraft filter on it. That's the same filter that I took off of it when I sent you the sample. So nice. Um, how would you expect the additives in the report to compare with the virgin oil? That's a good question. Uh, I, I, without knowing what it looks like, I would think it looks just like this. I uh, would being that it's a uh, modern oil, so API SP that calcium and magnesium level look completely normal. That's what we see with the new API SP oil because they had to lower the calcium levels from the old days. And they used to be up over 3000 parts per million because of that high level of calcium could cause low speed pre-ignition in engines just like yours. So with API SP, we now have a whole new series of low speed pre-ignition tests that had to be passed. So any API rated product that would you know, pass that test has to pass through all those. And the only way to do it is have the calcium levels below 1500 parts per million. And this puts you there, but it's got a nice blend between the calcium and the magnesium. Phosphorus and zinc are right there in the middle of what those ranges are, which are very typical uh, for a 5W30 API type oil. And then you got that little bit of my little bit of boron. Those are great synergists that help the ZDP do a better job. They reduce some friction as well. So, yeah, that to, that's a that looks like a pretty typical, normal, good API SP package. You know, kind of circling back to the TBN thing, I've seen people make comments about the API SP product and, oh, it's no good. You know, they're cheaping out. They're taking additives out. The TBN's not as high, blah, blah, blah. I'm telling you right now, these oils do a better job. Stop worrying about what the what the spec sheet says and listen to what the engine says. What said, I see. Go ahead. Oh, um, he said uh, somebody. Uh, what additives are you using in your oils? And my philosophy on that is, if you're putting an additive in your oil, it's not a very good oil. Um, Bingo. I don't, I don't run additives in my oil. We're talking about fuel Absolutely. additive. Absolutely. Yep, 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 exactly. Uh, good point. Good clarification here because I'm with you, man. Uh, if you've got, if you feel like your oil is not doing a good enough job, you got to put something in it to make it work. You need a different oil. Absolutely. Well, that yeah, goes back but, up here to what he said. He said, I don't know why people hate on mobile. Their premium oils are good. I've never had a failure or issue in 25 years. I have been using them and I, and I used to be on pins oil. Are you adding oil additives to your mobile? I mean, we've seen the results of mobile so I mean, far. Long trips when I use it, it's great. Oh. They're talking about Marvel. The fuel oh additive God, no, yeah, stuff. don't, yeah, don't, no, 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 no. For fuel I, yeah, I'm um, yeah, me, I, I still even like Marvel Mystery Oil for fuel out of me. It's it's fine for cleaning guns and as a just a all-purpose lubricant yeah, at home or around the shop uh, you know it's great for guns and stuff like that like i said but it's not something to put in your engine it, it no 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 really Either use you, absolutely it's use the right stuff use the oil that has all the correct additives in it when you for your engine now no, when I it comes to fuel the thing you need to use in fuel is a fuel additive that contains polyether amine. If like the PI from Amsoil is contains polyether amine, that is the chemistry that can actually clean 
intake valve deposits, injector deposits, be it port injected or fuel injected or, or direct injected, and also clean combustion chamber deposits. That's the correct chemistry is polyetheramine. Seafoam, uh, Startron, all that other stuff, don't use it. It does not contain polyetheramine. So unlike with API, where there are standards and there's tests, they have to pass before they can be marketed as an API rated product. There are no ratings. There are no rules for fuel additives. You can put whatever in a bottle you want. You can make any claim you want. So it's, it's sketchy. It really is. But the reality is we have what's called LAC fuel here in the U.S. So the EPA has a minimum requirement for a fuel detergency. That's very low, actually. So if you may have heard of what's called top tier gas. So top tier is not from the government. It's an industry collective, mainly with a lot of OEMs involved in it where these top tier fuels have a higher detergency package. They contain more polyetheramine, you know, from the terminal. So what's in the ground at the gas station has a higher detergent level. AAA had a, a study they published not long ago, independent test results between premium LAC fuel and premium top tier fuel. So not cheap 87, we're talking 93 but it's regular 93 versus top tier 93. The regular 93 produced 19 times more intake valve deposits than the top, the, the top tier fuel did. So while a direct injection engine like yours doesn't contain um, or doesn't have you know, intake valve deposit necessarily because you don't have port injection upstream. There's nothing you can really do about that. Um, the reality is your injector is in the combustion chamber. So when that engine's turned off, it heat soaks that injector and can carbonize and uh, cause lacquer and varnishes from the fuel inside that injector which makes the injector not atomize the fuel properly. And here's what happens. When the fuel doesn't atomize properly, it's, and it, it's large droplets, not small droplets, it can't vaporize. When it doesn't vaporize, it can't burn. Then what happens, because you've got O2 sensors and the engine's running in closed loop, it doesn't see the liquid fuel that didn't burn. It doesn't see the soot that is unburnt, just carbonized liquid fuel. So what does it do? It just sees that there's more oxygen, not enough fuel, hydrocarbon, so it adds more fuel. So what would happen is if you had been just running LAC fuel, not running the PI, your fuel dilution would have been considerably higher. I mean, I see it all the time. You know, we see customers that send in samples that will have two or three percent fuel dilution because they're just running regular gas. Even if they're running premium, they're still running regular gas and they're having this problem. They use one bottle of polyetheramine based product, you know, be it the Amsoil PI, you know, gum out complete fuel system cleaner, I mean, whatever, you know, Chevron, Tecron complete. Whatever you want to use, as long as it contains the polyetheramine, boom, the numbers drop just like that. And what happens is when you have less fuel in the oil, now the wear goes down. Every time we see a high wear problem, nine, 99 times out of 100, you have a high fuel problem as well, which means the fuel dilution was what caused the high level of wear. Without the fuel dilution, the, you don't have the high wear. We see that over and over again, especially when customers do begin using a fuel additive and their fuel dilution drops, the wear rate drops.
So that's the biggest piece about this. And again, back to why, why did I say overall, man, you're good. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't worry about the viscosity is because I can see that fuel dilution is where it's supposed to be. And now I know why your fuel dilution is so good, even for a direct injection engine. As you mentioned, you're about a 25 uh, minute drive to work, mostly highway miles. 25 and miles. Also, yeah. 25 miles. Okay. Yeah, 25 miles. 25 miles highway. And then you've got um, the fuel additive in there. You're doing all the right things. If Lake sees that an oil isn't performing, does he typically recommend to the customer a different oil brand or does he recommend different composition specs? I, I will try to uh, gently encourage someone to pursue a different chemistry. I, I don't recommend brands. I try to be brand agnostic. I don't want to come across as one of these people that's tied up to one brand. I have a history, obviously, um, with one particular brand of oil, but I, I don't try to do that because I don't want someone to feel like that. <sighs> the brand question can be hard, right? We know people can be religiously passionate about oil brands. And in the end, I don't really care what brand of oil you use. It doesn't matter to me. There's only four companies that make all the additives that go into every brand of oil anyway. So they all buy their stuff from one of those four. And then here, in, you know, really, there's only three PAO manufacturers in the whole world. You know, Chevron Phillips, Enios, and ExxonMobil. So everyone's getting their components from a small group of people. Why are we being so crazy about what brand of oil it is? In the engine, what, what I really care about is my engine. Does my engine like this chemistry or not? And, and I, when you see, go ahead. I was going to say, you said it many live streams ago, you're not brand specific, like you just said. Mm -hmm. Whatever works for you. Obviously, yeah. AMS oil works great for me in my engine, where I live, the climate Absol that I live Absolutely. in. Absolutely. Just because I'm an AMS oil dealer doesn't mean that I'm using it. I mean, yeah, I get a good deal on it, but I run it in all my vehicles. And the climate that I live in, you live in the same state as me. We get mm -hmm. a lot of pollen. It gets very hot in the summertime very muggy. Uh, you get all four seasons in one day. Yes, and sir. So it works for me and my vehicle and what I'm using it for. <laughs> Wherever right. you may live, you may live in Colorado or up in the mountains somewhere. It may not work as good for you as it does for me. So, and you explained that last time, a couple of live streams ago. I mean, I forget who I've told what to. <laughs> yeah, it's I talk too much, right? <laughs> uh, Chris, Chris uses AMS oil and his it works great for him. He lives in California. Um, trouble, he said, um, he's going to be switching to AMS oil. Um, I think he just asked a question about Marvel, so I shouldn't continue running MMO as a fuel additive. Is what he's asking. No. No, no, no. It's that that's not a great fuel additive. No, you're way better off running a polyethylamine based uh, fuel additive. Uh, I mean, personally, I just use the uh, gum out complete fuel system cleaner because I can go buy that at Target or O'Reilly's or wherever I go. There, it's everywhere, and it's got all the good PA in there. But it's not the only one. It, it, it's it's what's again what's available to you that has the correct chemistry that gets the job done. That's the key thing. I love, I love, I love how you said that, Anthony, is that it's, it's not about what brand it is. It's what works for you. Use what gets the job done. And oil analysis is the way to let you know if it's getting the job done. Chris says, how long does gasoline last in a car's tank? That well, I've heard when I went to engine class, it, mm -hmm. it may be true. It may not be true. It can start to break down depending on where you live and the environment you live in. It can start to break down in 14 to 30 days. Now Absolutely. We, yeah. So. so yeah. Uh, the, the more ethanol that's in the fuel, the shorter the oil, the fuel's life will be. Mm -hmm. uh, the lower the octane of the fuel, the shorter the oil's life will be. I and like this like, afternoon. <laughs> so what? Uh, somebody said, I like Lake's, Lake, Lake's answers. He's a smart man and has all the right answers. I'm impressed. 
Oh, thank you. I, I try to be even handed about these things. I've been doing this for a while and you know, you, you, you see a lot of different things. You've been fortunate to work with a lot of good people and you just say, you know, trying to steer people in the right direction, not trying to pick a fight, not trying to be right or wrong. Just try to give guidance and say, Hey, you kind of go this way. You're probably going to end up in a better place than if you go that way. Uh, funny that came, question about fuel came up. You know, you made the comment you never seen me wearing a hat before. Mm. That's because over at my dad's shop this afternoon, you know, we've been doing some stuff. We we're trying with my dad's old cars. He's 75 years old. And the idea is we're going to get him back on the racetrack one last time, not for a race, just to go have a practice session, uh, go out there and go drive the car at full speed again. Around so we're getting these old. We're going to go to Virginia International Raceway, VIR. It's a road course. I, I race there. I race motorcycles there. Oh, okay. Then you get it because there's yeah. no, there's not a lot of hard walls close to the racetrack. It's a great guy, place for a guy who's 75 to go up there and go fast, right? Plenty of runoff <laughs> when you fall off a motorcycle. Trust me. Been there. Yeah, exactly. We're on the same page here. North or south course? We want to do the full course. Okay, you're doing the full course. Uh, north we want to do the full course. North course is usually turn seven. It's it's when you come down the back straight, you know, that hotel that's off to the left. Mm -hmm. You go yep. underneath the walkway, turn seven. Full course, you would go straight. Uh, when it's yeah. the north course, turn seven, it kind of goes up a hill. Third session, every time I go, I always eat it right there because it, it's like open incline and then it crests over a hill. And, you know, you're tired, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, back to what we were saying. So, Sorry. He, so, uh, dad actually raced there last in the vintage stock car series back in 2003. Uh, he won one of the races, uh, the didn't win the next race. The other guy had, um, way bigger engine than dad did. And dad was down power, but that was the first time he had ran this new engine. It was actually his old backup motor because his regular engine had been gotten tired. So he sent it to the engine shop to get it freshened up. So he used the backup motor for a couple of races and that thing was 40 horsepower off what the other one was. We know that now. Um, he didn't know that back then. And so he was getting yarded by the other guy because the other guy had 40 horsepower on him. Dad still beat him the first time. Second time the, the guy put on sticker tires and dad didn't put stickers on and, and the other guy got him. But then we went to Daytona and dad did some stuff to the car arrow wise to make it slicker through the air and he still beat him even though he was down 40 horsepower to the guys at Daytona, he still kicked their butt. So that car has been sitting ever since then. So that was 2004. So what, 19 years the car has been sitting. So we broke it out today. And one of the things we were worried about was the fuel cell and the fuel in it. And yeah, obviously it didn't smell as fresh and it kind of turned a little bit darker color but we drained that old Sunoco 114 out of that thing. And it, 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 it wasn't horrible. Now we pumped it all out and we, we, you know, put it, we'll put on some fire ant beds and stuff and kill some ants with it. <laughs> you know, by the way, fire uh, ants are bad here. Uh, yes, we they get are some big ones. They're so. bad, bad, bad. And the ground hornets too, right? Mm -hmm. And those things are the worst. Uh, that's why they, the Charlotte Hornets, there's that name's for real for a reason. Um, but so we'll use it for that. But I was actually kind of amazed how stable it was. But it's a race fuel. And so the thing is, the higher the octane of the fuel, the more inherently stable the fuel is. So when you're using cheap 87 octane fuel, this actually 83 octane, then they put in 10% ethanol, that bumps it to 87 that fuel can go bad pretty quickly. Um, you know, 30 to 60 days is pretty n normal uh, for pump fuel as it begins to, to, to go off. And depending upon how you store it, like I said, it can, it can be even worse than that. Uh, you know, storing it outside where their UV rays can get to it is the worst thing you can possibly do. Uh, if it tank can breathe, it will be, that's also bad. So, you know, fuel storage, is a, a big thing. So that was that fuel cell being closed up and having the drive brake and everything on it. 
was probably one of the main reasons why. And there was also very little fuel, right? It wasn't stored full. It wasn't stored. It was not totally empty, but it was almost empty. We probably got less than a gallon of fuel out of it. Um, that comes to two other questions here. Uh, does Lake think mileage or engine hours are better for wear reference? Well, one engine hour is equal to about 30 miles, 33 miles, give or take. So would you go engine hours or miles? Miles. I, I would prefer to go miles because uh, engine hours, like you said, can be somewhat misleading. If you, I mean, if, if you got a vehicle that idles a whole lot, it doesn't get a lot of miles. The reality is you send in the report. If you have a high wear rate per mile, which is how I, I want to look at it, it's easy for me to tell you you need to adjust what you're doing because I can see that for the mileage you have on the car, you have a lot of wear. And that could be just short trip driving or it could be the fact that you have a lot of idle time and then driving. Whatever it is, doesn't matter to me. It's the fact that you have a high wear rate. And that's really, that's, one of the reasons why it's the last thing on the sheet is because it's also, to me, one of the most important things on the sheet. You know, I mentioned earlier, you could have all the measured results be green, but the wear rate, which is calculated, could be yellow. And if that's the case, then I'm going to have a yellow you know, caution condition on the report overall because the overall picture has told me that you got a higher wear rate and you want to fix that. So mine's at four. So mm -hmm. my wear rate is four every 1,000 miles. So yep, that's low. Yeah, four parts per million of wear per 1,000 miles. That's really good. And where was it? Uh, what winter storage additive would Lake recommend for fuel, like in my Goldwing that gets, if he's lucky, 1,000 kilometers a year? Okay, that's a great question. So fuel stabilizers are, are really good. Um, I'm going to go back to the complete fuel system treatments, especially there's, I think there's a Chevron has what's called the Tecron Marine. Mm -hmm. um, you want something that mentions, you know, stabilization uh, in the label, but you also would like to have um, the detergent package, the PEA in there. So a lot of the complete fuel system treatments and complete seems to be kind of a marketing term that says it's everything and a kitchen sink in it in terms of the, the additive package. The complete ones are the ones that do a really good, good job on that. Obviously, Stabil has been around for a long time by itself. Just the regular Stabil product is a uh, stabilization additive, but it doesn't contain all the other detergents and stuff. Now they may have a newer product that contains more things in it, but if you kind of go that route of the complete fuel system treatment, you'll find what you need, I believe. Will Lake put his dad's track run on his YouTube channel? Absolutely. So well, uh, it's going to be Stapleton 42 is the guy we've been working with. He's he, Mitchell's been doing the video stuff, but yeah, when we go to the racetrack, that's it. So yeah, today was the first day of getting the, the old car, uh, putting some air in the tires, getting it up on jack stands, pulling it all off, man, the brake rotors, woo -hoo, mm. brake pads. I mean, we got to go change all, I mean, we trained all the fluids out of it. Uh, so we're going to, you know, lead all the brakes, put new brake fluid in, New, new transmission fluid, new gear. We had to put, uh, you know, the last time the car raced was at Daytona. So I had a 400 gear in it. So we're going to go back to VIR. We're going to put a 457 gear in it. Uh, we made it making more power this time than we did last time <laughs> by a lot. So the last time you raced, you had a 463 gear in it. So we went to a little bit, little bit uh, you know, taller gear, 457, not a big difference, but we use that gear. So we got to put gear oil in it. We got to get fuel. We got to, we got a lot, of, a lot to do. April 5th is when we hope to be able to go to the racetrack if we can get ready. Uh, one of the guys who used to work for my dad, Sam Allen, he worked with me at Melling. He came over and helped out. And Sam was just one of those guys that's been around racing his whole life and is fabricator, mechanic, you know, do all, everything. So 
I was blown away when we pulled the fuel cell out today. We were, there were two things that I was super concerned about, the battery and the fuel cell. And both of them looked immaculate, hmm. like you had just put them in. I couldn't believe it. It was absolutely miraculous. So I was like, mm, okay, well, <laughs> clean them all up, <laughs> put the battery in the battery tender, start charging it up, <laughs> drive the fuel cell out, put all the foam back in there and put some fresh fuel in it. And off we go. The oil in the oil tank looked brand new. The power steering fluid was the nastiest stuff I'd seen in a while, but it wasn't terrible. So we drained all that stuff out. So we'll hopefully put all fresh fluids in it, get the engine back uh, from the engine shop and actually a little interesting story about oil analysis. So we dynoed the engine. If you guys haven't seen it and you want to hear a Ford C3 head singing in a 780 horsepower song, you can go to, uh, Stapleton's YouTube channel and check it out. It's pretty awesome. Uh, engine sounded just phenomenal, you know, um, mm. nothing like them race but, engines, man. Oh God, man, that sounds so good, man. Just, laying in the throttle man they were great but anyway we did we did uh oil analysis um from that dyno session from the braking oil and the race oil we found water in both samples mm -hmm. and the reality was the water was increasing so we only had the racing oil race oil in the engine for a very short amount of time compared to the braking oil yet there was more water in the braking or in, in the race oil well that told me something we have a leak that was getting worse as the engine got hotter. Mm -hmm. So more than likely there's a, there's a pinhole or something in the cylinder heads and we're going to, we're going to find that, fix that, put the engine back together, put it back in the dyno, make sure it's good. Now we know that the fuel cell uh, is that older fuel cell that ran in the day before we had oxygenated fuels. We're, we don't, see a need to replace the fuel cell or the bladder or any of the foam or any of the fuel lines. Now what we're going to need to do is use a fuel like that. What we don't want to do is put in an oxygenated fuel or some kind of ethanol or methanol containing fuel that could wreak havoc on all that. So we were thinking until recently that we were going to have to replace fuel cell, foam, lines, the whole nine. And with that case, then I'll, we can put some Q16 or some kind of oxygenated fuel in there that's more powerful. We'll take advantage of that. Well, we're not going to do that now. We're going to back off that plan and go back with something that's non-oxygenated because we don't want to take a risk of having those things melt or have a bad chemical reaction. So this is all the things you get to know and you, problems you got to kind of face and decisions you got to make. If you guys have never drove a NASCAR before, I highly recommend you do it. Like I got to do eight <laughs> laps around Charlotte back in. You do the Petty Deal. Um, I think this or one the, was the Jeff Gordon School back in back in the oh, day. Oh, cool! Like in, I think it was like two thousand and two, something like nice. that. I did did eight laps. I drove Matt Kenseth number seventeen DeWalt car. I think it was. Mm -hmm. Because he they match you by height of the of the driver, and I was closest to his height. Okay, cool. So. I had to go through uh, on the infield. Uh, you know where they have the conference room you know, mm -hmm. in the infield. I had to go in there in the big conference room. They had to go over all the rules and regulations with us and stuff like that. And then they took us out to the track. We got in the van, went around the track. Mm -hmm. and then he then he stops in the middle of turn three and four where it's banked like this. <laughs> You're like, ah. Oh. <laughs> and everybody's like trying to lean to the other side of the van because they think yeah. they're going to fall over. All over, right? It's it was fun. It's an experience, man. If you ever get a chance to drive a NASCAR, go to one of those schools. It's it's an all day thing, and you get to drive it. It's it's not them driving you. It's you driving it. Now they can do the one where they have uh, somebody take you around the track where you get to ride. Right. So my mom didn't want to ride or drive. She had actually drove or uh, rode in one of Jeff Gordon's cars, and it's one of the guys that test his cars or something at the time. And mm -hmm. I remember going down the back straight because you're following behind like your instructor and he just keeps mm -hmm. speeding up and speeding up. As long so, as you can maintain the right distance, they mm -hmm. keep going faster and faster. Yep. So I remember it was probably like my fourth or fifth lap in. We we're on the back straight and he started to move over closer to the apron. And I was like, 
what in the world's going on? And then I didn't see it or hear it until it was in front of me. And then it was a dot. It was my mom in Jeff Gordon's car riding passenger with a professional driver past me on the right close uh, on the wall. And I didn't hear it till he went by. And then I was like, Oh man, <laughs> <laughs> Dude, he was, he, he was, he, he, he was, he was everybody, booking. man. He was booking. Yeah. Like, um, yeah, that was an experience. It's really fun. Uh, if you guys never get a chance to do that, do it. Uh, they have them all over the place. They have Charlotte. They used to do Rockingham, but Rockingham's closed. Um, they do Talad. I don't know if they do Talladega or not. I know they do Daytona. Hey, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if they Talladega is a very very fast track. So I would and, almost think it would be, it would be boring yeah. in one of those driving school cars because it it's just the tracks just like you it like you said. There's so much banking. It kind of turns the car for you. It'd be like, it does. Eh, it doesn't really do anything, yeah. you know. Where you, places like it says Charlotte, Atlanta, places like that, man, it's it's absolutely fun yeah. because you're still driving the car and it's you're getting experience. Everything I would think, like uh, the Nashville track, I bet that one would be really awesome. It's concrete. It's kind of cool. Glenn. If, if they do there, oh man, all the road courses are the best. I mean, that's that's driving right there. But it was fun. Like when you're coming off of. Uh... Uh, turn three and four, and you know you're coming on the front straight. You know how Charlotte kind of has that apex right there mm -hmm. at the start finish line. They told us, you know, when we're in the van, this is a do not let off the throttle track. Your foot is on the floor the whole time. The whole time, yeah. The whole time, you never have to let off. So, you know, you're driving this car at full speed, and you're coming around this turn, and you're like, oh man, I need to slow down. And then you remember, like, foot stays on throttle, like push it down. It it literally just pulls you in. <laughs> It was so yeah. cool, man. But yeah, it gives you probably a different respect for those guys when you when you watch the in car camera and they and they go flying off into one and you hear them lift and they're out of the throttle for a long time. Mm -hmm. You're mm -hmm. like, oh, they're going really fast. <laughs> they are, and you are. And then they get back to the gas and they right there like <laughs> they're and easy. The, and it, and you're in there. It, the seat hugs you. And your head mm -hmm. doesn't move back and forth because we had to wear. No, the Hans device wasn't out at the time. Yeah, it okay. was. Yeah, it was. I think it was. We did have to wear the Hans device. So you're you're literally tucked into this thing, and the rearview mirror goes across the whole windshield, so you can see literally everything behind you. Yeah. And they said it takes about a lap, lap and a half to get up to full speed, because basically your instructor in front of you is like, okay, he can keep up. He's doing what I tell him to do. You're looking at the flag box like. As long as you got a green flag, you keep going and going. It right. was just experience. I want to go That's back cool. and do it again. But yeah, me wanting to go do it right now. Come on, let's, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it, man. I mean, you probably have access to a track better than I do. Ah, <laughs> uh, no, those, those those guys want your money to go do that stuff. You know, they don't yeah. let, they don't let you just go out there. I, I did my a funny story about the driving school thing was when they. Uh, they've since paved Charlotte Motor Speedway, but before they paved it, most recently, they went out there and they and they did grinding on the track, and they were grinding it all around. And I was like, you know, that's interesting. My crew chiefs and everybody at Gibbs were talking about it, what it was like, and I got the idea that I'm going to drive over there. I, I have my, you know, supercharged vehicle we had at the time and I, i'm just going to go over there and what's the worst thing i do throw me in nascar jail i'm gonna find out yeah. so went over the track and that the petty school was out there running and one of the guys hey you know during one of the breaks do you guys mind if i go make a couple of laps and told them who i was and they're like oh okay we know who you are that's fine and i said they said but here's the thing you got to have one of the in instructors has got to ride with you I said, that's fine no problem I said, all right, why do you want to be out here anyway? So we, they've grooved the track. I was interested to see, you know, what it does. Um, that's all, you know, because I know the track fairly decently enough. been around racing and I know there's bumps here and there. kind of want to get a feel for it because it's supposed to be a lot smoother. I said, yeah, you know, we, we've been seeing it a little bit too. This is what they had some feedback from what they've seen from out there with the with the classes and, and the students. I'm like, oh, okay, that's interesting to know. And out there and 
made a couple of laps. And of course, you know, the instructor guy, we're ch chatting and everything. He's like, you just, you don't need to go that fast. <laughs> like, That's okay. You know, and it's like, you know, just getting a feel for what it was doing. Uh, but it then it came back, told the crew chiefs what, what, you, what you felt about it. And they're like, Oh, that's great. Cool. So it wasn't, you're trying to get intelligence. Right. Mm -hmm. But those guys are out there all the time and they, they know what they're doing. So it's, it's a great place to go get that experience that you really couldn't get otherwise. What I thought was really cool. You come out of the pit, you're limited to so many thousand RPMs for pit road speed. Mm -hmm. You know, soon as you cross that line, your foot is on the floor and you're shifting and you come out, you come off apron onto the track. It's like all air movement and all noise is gone. Like you can yeah. hear the hum of the engine, but that's it. It's not rumbling anymore, but all air movement is gone. It's just, yeah, it's, it's amazing. But like you, we had the little tube hooked up where it would blow air into us where it hooks up to the, the window or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I was just like, wow, it's really loud in here going down pit road. And all of a sudden he took off and I was behind him foot to the floor, shifting gears. And it was just like, it's, it's not noisy anymore. It's, it's calming actually. <laughs> so it's an experience. No, it's, it's, it's neat. Yeah. Those cars will move. No doubt they, about it. They will go. Any more questions about the your report? This was kind of fun to do. Uh, yeah. You know, usually you, you do a little email and you send it off to the customer. You don't get, usually do a live stream with the customer and go over all their results and tell them what's going on. It's kind of neat. I was interested in it. And I was like, you know, I told everybody first how quick it was, the turnaround time. Um, like I said, I did it on Sunday. That's what we try to go for. I mean, this is your, your situation worked out the way I like it to be yeah. was the ideal scenario. You dropped it on Monday and we were able to get to your results too on Friday. Yep, That I did doesn't one. always happen, you know, with the standard kit, uh, being literally, you know, five business days. That's the goal. We try to get there, but sometimes the postal service will be delayed yeah. or there's a holiday or something like this or that. And then it stacks. So it, it I mean, seven days that we tell people, Hey, 70 bucks, seven days, you get your results. It, We're trying to get it done faster than that. Obviously. It and came, I'm glad it worked out for you. It did. It came in a white box. It's actually sitting right here on my table. Um, inside the box, there's already a prepaid priority mail box mm -hmm. and it has the kit inside of it in a bag. It's got the bottle. It has the instructions. And then tells you how to do it, obviously. And once you get done with it, you fill the bottle up to the line and seal it, put it back in the bag, stick it inside that prepaid priority mail. And then you go back to the website because the bottle has a number on it. If you look, uh, does, can you see mine on there? Mine was SDS0730. 730, yep. So that number on the bottle, you have to go back onto his website and register that. You'll put your name your vehicle, like you see on mine, where it's got my VIN number, my name, and then the type of oil that's up in that first block up there, the type of oil, how many miles I went and all that stuff. Once you do that, you drop that in the mailbox. And I literally had it, my results. I was in Walmart grocery shopping and I was like, email, oh, <laughs> speed diagnostic. Oh, my results are in. Oh, cool. <laughs> it is quick, quick turnaround time. And I like that it's color coded and everybody was like looking at your channel, like, man, his, his results are color coded. And they were asking me, like do, you, do you think he can get on a live stream with you? I was like, let, let me email him right quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We try to make it easy. Like you don't need to know anything about oil analysis or chemistry or anything to be able to use this and it be functional for you. If you can know, navigate a stoplight, you can use this. That's, that's all you got to know. Just, red, yellow, green. If I come to a red light, do I know how to do proceed? Right. If it's green, I go. If it's yellow, I need to kind of be thinking about what's happening here. If it's red, I need to stop. That's how we look at it. It's that simple. Yeah. And then, like I said, mine is green up there. My condition is green. My, it's good to go. But what was it wasn't really concerning. It was just interesting was my mm -hmm. uh, my uh, viscosity. viscosity. Yep. But you explain that in detail why it's like that. So. Right. So in the in my report is basically I got straight A's, guys. So yes, sir. You did good. You did excellent, man. You're killing. But I'm it. I'm gonna do another one at about the same mileage. Same, like I said, same oil filter. I'm not gonna use the uh, upper cylinder lube this time. 
but I will do a bottle of fuel injector cleaner and then I'm going to send you another sample. And that way we can get the uh, side by side comparison. Now that'd be great. That'd be interesting to see. Uh, somebody said, to be honest, I really want to try this oil test. It's very informative and cool beans. Awesome. Uh, mobile diesel. I know, right? Oh, so let me pop his website up here right quick. So you guys can go over there if you want to get you a kit. Yeah. Um, that's, that's his website. That's um, one. It's really easy to do. Go on there, order the kit. $69.95 or it's like 70 bucks or something like that. Yeah. It comes directly to, to your you. house. Like I said, everything you need right there in the box. All the instructions. Yeah. Just yeah. follow the instructions. It's pretty simple. And, and it's even good. Boom. There, you can know. Yeah, see, that's I had already put everything in the prepaid box before. There you so go. if you look here, I wrote like, okay, it's a 2019 Ranger. It has this many miles. Those were my notes so I could go back and fill it in on the website because I forgot. There you go. <laughs> but Well, a lot of people forget. In fact, I think last week, seven of them showed up all at once. We call them orphans when they show up at the lab and there's no submission form for them. I can't do anything with it. Fortunately, I have a friend that I was like, you know what? These are suspicious. These numbers, ID numbers, I think I know who they are. And I called him the other day. I said, hey. Did you send a bunch of samples in? Yeah. Did I forget to do the forms? Uh-huh. Oh, man, I'm sorry. I'll get it done for you real quick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, don't worry about it. But, yeah, as long as you, that's the other part of it, right? You said take the sample, do all the stuff, make sure you fill out the form online. And if you do all that stuff at the same time, drop the mail, boom, makes it super easy. Super duper easy. And you get a nice color-coded result like this. Hopefully everybody else is, else is in the green, too. And he also had one of these cards in here. Love racing. The whole oh, racing yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, PRI membership. And then uh, protect your right to race cars, trucks, and motorcycles. So that was pretty cool. Yep. The PRI and SEMA people are trying to I – mean, they're not trying. They, they are lobbying on the behalf of our industry every day in D.C. to mm. allow us to continue to do what we do, to have the right to choose who services your vehicle to have the right to continue to modify your vehicle. We, we, we take these rights for granted as Americans. That's not the case in many countries. So it's something we have to continue to fight for. I'm actually a PRI um, PAC member and I'm on the board of the PRI PAC because I recognize that as I've traveled the world and been able, been fortunate to, to do that, that a lot of the things we the freedoms we have here are unique to our country and we want to protect that. Mm -hmm. So it's important to have people in DC lobbying to make sure we protect those rights. Uh, he wants to know um, if you can test samples from Canada. Um, I'm sure you can. We, we can. The trick is, so with, with the Canadians, um, they just need to contact us via email. We can send you a, we can send you the sample bottles but it won't have the prepaid mailer to come back to the U.S. They have to pay. Of course, it gives you a discount. You're not, you're not paying um, for the shipping on the way back with the kit, but you got to pay for it yourself. As long as you're good with that, we can ship it to you, and then you can send it back to us uh, with the lab address and everything <laughs> ready to go. So Darren, uh, contact him through email on his website. And uh, yep. see if we can get you a sample going, man. I want to see your results. That'd be interesting to see, too. Um, I think Trouble said he's going to do one, too. Awesome. See if we can keep you busy. How about that? That'd be good. So this is me and my two sons do do this deal. So I've got one of them building kits and one of them helping me with the, with the data entry and all that kind of stuff. And, and so it, it would be fantastic. He they, said, they, 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 they need to be busier. <laughs> says i'm going to order me a couple of test kits for my old buses and my old 1954 mac and i will also test my 6 Ooh, nice so yeah you should have some should have some samples coming in there buddy yeah get get the shop kit right if you got that many things buy the shop kit it's cheaper per sample that way that's the way to yeah, go don't that's buy the, the individual ones that, that that costs you way too much money do it that way buy the shop kit it's got six bottles with two mailers if you're going to have that much stuff nice see i didn't even know that so yeah i want to do uh my rear end fluid too or my train yeah you can fluid. do that yeah you can do that but we're going to call it right here lake thank cool, you man. for stopping by
Guys, I was really interested to see this oil report and the way you broke it down. I really appreciate that. My engine's good. I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing. You guys go to this website, order you a kit, send a sample in, see what's going on inside your engine. And I'm going to end it right here. Thank you, guys. See ya.